For today's talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about APIs, um, a little bit about um, our products and how you can use our products to um, automate the delivery of your APIs in the API management environment. So um, I'm going to kick off with a very few slides. Um, then I'll hopefully spend about 20, 25 minutes on the demo, and then hopefully that gives us some time for a Q&A. Um, so there we go. This is the world that we live in. We've got our SaaS applications, applications, mobile applications, and all that nice stuff. Um, everything these days is connected with, with, with APIs. Um, I mean, we all know APIs, the word API, the word API has become extremely fashionable. It has been around for a very long time and it's sort of taken on the new meaning in the sense that we're now talking about APIs that happen over um, um, an HTTP protocol. Um, and highly necessary, obviously, to, to go over an HTTP protocol in an internet connected world and especially in a cloud world where SaaS applications are only delivered over HTTP, where mobile mobile phones mainly, own, not only, but mainly talk HTTP, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it has enabled us. But if you want to do you want to deploy APIs without the management, you will miss out on a lot of things. You'll miss out on, on speed and, and agility. Um, you will lose out on the visibility of how your APIs are being used. Um, the security will be as diverse as the number of APIs that you have. And this is that control over who accesses your APIs and what will be very disparate. Um, and in the same, in, to the same, that same extent, measuring how your API is being used is going to be very difficult. So, let and and that's just a starter. And then we're still, you know, if you want, if you want to think a little bit further about publicizing your APIs, creating an engagement with external developers, or creating some profitability about, about from your APIs, if you don't centrally manage your APIs, you will not get any of that that advantage. So there is a heavy need, we all know that, and that's why I'm not going to spend too much time on it, heavily need API management solutions um, to make use of the, the, the API investments that you've made into, into developing those. So generally, what do people expect out of API management solutions? Well, they are here on your screen, but actually not everybody will expect all of these, um, these, you know, creating a buzz, or not everybody's interest in, interested in analyzing and optimizing the performance. That will depend on the persona that you are. So, product API product managers generally are interested in every single aspect, but people like DevOps engineers will mainly be interested in thinking, thinking about securing that business data and, and managing that API lifecycle and uh, to a very large extent automate that lifecycle, which is where I'm going to head with, uh, with the demo in a minute. Um, so to that extent with software ag we have we have a number of products i just realized um, i have to get rid of something annoying on my screen which is probably in your screen as well here we go um we've got a number of of, of products that that all work uh, nicely together um and today I'm going to be spending quite a lot of time talking about the API gateway, which is sort of a central point where we're going to manage uh, things like security and, and the life cycle of your APIs. Um, but we were talking earlier on about, about uh, engagement with developers and, and uh, monetizing potentially your APIs. And that's where your API gateway, which is where you manage the runtime security, needs to be complemented with what we call a developer portal, which is essentially look at it as the app store for your APIs. This is where you sell your APIs. And that's, I, that may sound as if you're selling it to third parties, which is quite possibly what you will be doing, but that might be internal clients as well. So monetizing does not necessarily mean ma making loads and loads and loads of monies, although some people just do that purely out of the APIs. But monetizing the APIs might just help enable partners, for example, to develop applications based on your APIs, and that will create a stream of revenue. 
Um, so that's your developer portal. Next thing on which I won't, won't spend too much time, but I will, I will make sure you get all the um, necessary details about where you can find more information about is the micro gateway. It's essentially the API gateway, the product that we'll see throughout the demo, but literally stripped down to the essentials where it does nothing but protecting your APIs. Whereas a full-fledged API gateway comes with the user interface, uh, comes with manageability features, comes with things like um, uh, monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. The micro gateway itself will not do all that. And the idea behind the micro gateway is that it starts up really quickly. You can deploy it just as a Java app next to your applications, or it can be deployed in containers, either in a container where you already have developed your APIs, um, as long as it contains a Java runtime, or you can deploy it as a sidecar um, and expose your APIs that way and make your, um, you know, make the users or force the users to go through the micro gateway before they hit your back end. App Mesh is sort of an extension to the um, uh, micro gateway. Um, it, it, a lot of people are, are working with with service mesh, and it's it helps with people who are using a service mesh, which which quickly can become a service mess. If, excuse the pun, or the poor pun, but with the you know with the, the ever expansion of a service mesh, it be, it becomes really difficult to manage. Managing your services as applications makes that a lot easier. And, it, you know, from the API gateway extend, you know, using the extension of micro gateways and app mesh, you, you can manage your services and your service mesh as if they are applications in there. Um, to that extent, it will not, I will not demo that. But if you want more information, um, if you come to our booth on Software AG booth on the API Days London, Live London, so that is, if you're on your screen, um, underneath agenda, stages, workshops, you have the partner village. Go to the partner village, find Software AG. We have a small pre recorded demo of what an app mesh is and what it can do for you. And please do not hesitate to get in touch if you want to know even more than that. Um, we also have a product called Engage. It's it's a platform that we've developed. It's uh, online only, um, and it creates sort of an ecosystem to promote, market, and launch your APIs. So you can create things like hackathons for partners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and and create that engaging environment whereby you get direct feedback, etc. Um, these are usually shorter engagements uh, with with partners or engagements that you set up on a frequent on a regular basis um, and it's an online uh, thing uh, only and then the last thing in this in in on on the side um in the products that i'm going to mention is basically central side and that's our api and asset catalog um with the ever-growing number of apis we also see that people might not do not stick to one single API single instance of an API gateway uh, API gateways are sometimes um, installed per department per business unit or they might just be installed based on network things like network topology um, and helped by a new licensing model whereby we no longer license based on um, based on cores and CPUs, we now license based on usage. So on the number of calls, you, API calls that are being made. So we do so we as Software AG no longer care how many API gateways you install. If you want to install one, two, or three, or you want to install 12, that's up to you. Um, they are your resources. You set up how many you want. We now charge and we make it a lot easier to do departmental and sort of if you wanted a federated API gateway. However, as a downside, it means that again, with scattered API gateways or um, everywhere in your organization, it becomes difficult to, 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 to have an overview of the APIs that you get have and the, and the versions that you have and the dependencies that you have between them. And that's that product centric side. Centric side has been around uh, um, for a very long time because it doesn't only do API assets, but it also does um, um, 
any other integration assets, B2B assets that um, fit into our portfolio and has been around since the days that we were all talking about service-oriented architectures. Um, but it allows you to manage, it allows you to, to get a better overview of the, the, the API lifecycle. So before I go into demo, one thing, are you required to, to move your work cloud to a cloud vendor to achieve the hybrid deployment? Well, yes and no. You, there are many ways you can, you, you, you can deploy your API gateways. We, de we provide uh, an API gateway in the cloud that you can subscribe to. Um, you can install them uh, on premise. You can install them in the cloud and on uh, on premise. You can do it any hybrid, which any which way you want, and that suits your needs. That's fine. Um, and again, that fits into that license model that I just that I re earlier uh, referred to. It's own, you're only charged on the amount of API calls that you do. So without further ado, I, I, I'll go into a little bit of a demo. So what I'll demo first is a very simple example of um, an API lifecycle whereby we're going to import a definition of an API, look at what policies we can, we can, we can set, <clears throat> and then go, up, go all the way to activating, and I'll show you some of the features. The nice thing what we're going to what we um, so everything that I'll be doing will be every click that I make during that demo will be available as an API call itself. So in in, in itself, our API management, our API gateway, um, has lots of APIs itself to ma to manage those APIs. I know it sounds a little bit like the film Inception, but it's it helps you enormously with automating that and that's where i want to get and that's what i'll then demo next which so everything that you've seen live we're just going to go through a script that will deliver everything um and then hopefully by the end of by the end of the uh, the demo we'll have some time left to do q a okay so this is this is our API gateway. Um, this is an instance, a very simple instance that we've deployed in our cloud. Uh, it's used, it's as you can see in the URL. This is used by the pre-sales guys in our UK, uh, in the UK organization. Um, and we manage our APIs, we manage policies. Obviously, in combination with those policies, we'll have things like applications that can be. Uh, can combine a number of APIs, and we also have things like packages, uh, which is where you can work on the monetization of those APIs. Um, now let's go to a, through a very simple uh, example. I've already have some APIs that are being used by my colleagues. Um, um, there are two two types of um, APIs in there. You can see this RESTful APIs and SOAP APIs. Not going to spend too much time on it. Just quickly going to click on number conversion, which is a SOAP API. Um, with just a simple click of the button. So this is a SOAP API, which has two operations. Those two operations, just basically with a single click. Let's just go back to operations. And then you can do a REST transformation. And just with click on or click off, you can restify if that's that's not a nice that's not a good word but you can create a rest api out of a soap api um and that's all i wanted to say about that so let's go back and let's now create an api um, i'm not going to create an api from scratch there is already an api definition um, you can design APIs from scratch here as well. That is a possibility if you want to do API for API led or API first. But in this case, we're going to assume an API already exists. I'm going to import the API from a file. You can import them from a URL, which is exactly the same thing. It, instead of having it on your computer, you fetch it uh, from where it is online. And like I said, you can create an API from scratch as well, which would take up too much time um, given that we need to stop this by about 10 to 4 UK time. So I've got a definition file here ready for you. Um, it's something that some people might be aware of, but it's it, 
it's out there. It's the Star Wars API. The Swagger file, I can give you a version number, although there's probably a version number included in the Swagger file. And I do create. And all that information has now automatically been imported. So we've got our native endpoints. The technical information, oh, sorry, technical information is the endpoint, sorry. Um, we've got our resources and methods. So we've got a um, one, two, three, we've got seven uh, resources here, each with, and I know this is not the most exciting, but it's only got gets, so each, uh, each resource um, is linked to one single method. Obviously, more complex APIs will have not only gets, but also have puts and uh, puts and posts to update information. Um, not going to go into that uh, too much, but what we can do at this point, we can we could set up API mocking, which would enable people to try out an API. It is not something that is often done when an API has already been delivered, but when you create an API from scratch and start designing the API resource per resource and method per method, but haven't but you don't have a back end yet, this is where the API mocking can come in handy. Components are things like your schemas, which will be handy if you want to do checks against schemas. Um, in the case of get, you pr probably don't want to do that too much, but in case you want to do a post, you might want to um, check uh, against the schema whether whether what is being uh, what's the input of a post will actually match what is expected by the backend. So to make sure that your backend is not hit with uh, improperly formed data. And then there's, there's, there's obviously documentation which will become available as soon as I activate this API. Um, one of the first things that many people will do when, when they start uh, uh, looking at an API or importing an API and managing an API is looking at what, what policies to set. And for us in, in this product, policies can be, um, go from very simple things like enabling the, you know, making sure you check on things like transport, doing a threat protection. So everything you see on the left hand side. Um, but we also have identity uh, and access management, um, request processing, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is the UI. This is to make sure it's easy to use. And it's formed as such that your end user of your API is on the top here represented by what we is like a mobile phone. And um, you've got your native backends on the bottom, which are here represented by the sign of computer. And our, and our gateway will process rules as, um, or process those requests bit by bit. First, we'll look at threat protection, then we'll look at the transport mechanism. And if you want to do, for example, some identity uh, identification and access management. I need to edit this first. I could, for example, say for the whole of the API, I want to make sure that people have to identify themselves and I'll add that as a rule. And then I've got a number of methods that I can use for identification, like API keys, all the classic ones that you, you're probably aware of, uh, basic authentication, JSON web tokens, auth tokens, open ID, certificates, et cetera, et cetera, uh, bespoke headers, payload elements, everything is, is possible, everything is a go. Um, I'll just remove this for the time being. Request processing is where the, especially with existing APIs or APIs that come from um, old bespoke systems and do not necessarily follow a certain, do not follow protocols or what we know it or will not produce the responses that we have or will not, um, especially in the case of a post or a, a, a put or a, that, will not necessarily process the JSONs that we have. So we can um, transform these and, for example, create, you know, cr uh, transform that JSON into XML, uh, do some transformation, simple transformations on the XML if what is, you know, if, what, if, if some elements need to be left out, elements need to be added, things like that. Um, valid, validation of the API specification, validation of the schemas can be done, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, all the way up to data masking. And if for some reason you have already written some logic that will do that uh, transformation, but you've done it in another tool, we can use what we call a custom extension and you can just refer to any other external endpoint, which is an HTTP endpoint. You send payload over and the transformation is done. It comes back. Um, we also support Lambda functions. Azure functions are on their way and we can send it to any messaging platform. So there are many ways with this can this can be done. Um, <clears throat> routing, which is what you would expect is, is um, in this case, it's straight through routing because we know what the endpoint is, but you, we might have uh, scenarios where you might want to do conditional or content-based routing or version-based routing, etc. cetera. Um, there are many uh, cases where, you know, where content or conditional routing happens when people are migrating their backend systems. So for any request for information for that is very new, we'll send it to a new system for a request that uh, where we can deduct that the request or, um, or that the data sits in an older system, we can route that to the older system. So backends come in many, uh, many ways. Um, and then we can, forward the outbound, or the, so the incoming um, authentication and forward that to the outbound, uh, to the back end, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about, because I'm, we, I'm aware that we um, have limited time left, um, traffic monitoring is all about invocation of logs, monitoring the performance of your API, so where you can see that where the most time is spent, whether the time is spent on your API gateway, or and especially how long your backend stake. Um, and it's really interesting, for example, if you do load balancing, to start noticing that one of your uh, one of your nodes is starting to respond more slowly, so you can act on that, those kind of things. Um, and at that same point, and I know it's a bit of a weird thing, but weird placement, but it's the last thing we do essentially before we send the request back to the, to, or, re, or forward the request to the native backend, is we've got uh, um, capabilities of doing caching. And then when the request comes back, very simple, two more steps that we can undertake. Um, it's response processing, so it's exactly the, the opposite of what we did on the request processing. So the answer comes back, it is an XML payload, for example, and needs to be transferred to an, a JSON payload, or any other transformations that we need, need to be done, that can be done here. And then the last thing, a very simple one, uh, error handling, which um, rather which is essentially is going to take care of making sure that when an, when um, an error comes back from the native backend that we not necessarily expose all the information from the backend as we all know and uh, security aware people are very uh, will be very aware that the amount of information coming sometimes from a backend Java applications are notorious for that. The amount of uh, information that you can find in those error messages about what exactly is being used as a database, for example, in the back end or any other systems that are being called, it is a treasure trove and you can mask all that information very simply in the error handling uh, here. Um, there's one more thing that I wanted to know. All those policies, were set basically on the whole of the API. So every single method or every, and every single resource. We can create what we call scopes. A scope, you can give it any name, but can be a limit to, for example, say, look, I'm just gonna create a scope just for allegiances and the API films uh, resources. If you then save that, uh, custom extension, I probably need to delete that. I have now created new scope with the name new scope, not very original. If I now go back to my policies, I can, all these policies can be individually set either on the whole scope of the API or purely on the methods and resources that I've set. I'm gonna leave it at that. That's mainly this, that's the main the very first activities that you do when you start importing an API and want to activate it. Now, 
if you want to automate that whole process, that can be automated. So every single click that I made, remember, create new API, um, <clears throat> Um, create a new policy, create a scope, all those nice things. Everything can be done um, through uh, an API call. So to remain a bit, because there are many, there are many automation tools out there, like a, a Jenkins, and I've seen some people refer to Terraform, which is usually more used for infrastructure, um, but you know Terraform and 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 Ansible and other other tooling out there. I thought, well, let's just make use of a tool that we all know, Postman, because most people who work with APIs know Postman. So we've got a couple of use cases here, and so what? Hopefully, this is clear on the screen. An API. We're going to what we're going to do is we're going to create an API with a scope policy. Yeah, so it basically is a number of steps. It's written as a Postman uh, Postman test uh, script. Um, it's going to create the API from based on a URL. I can actually create an API from a URL. The body that we post is we say what's versions, what type it is. We're going to use the pet store. Um, API, which a lot of you will know, it's based the Swagger file can be found on that. We give it a name, we give it a description. Yep. And then what we're going to do is create a log invocation policy. So, as you've seen, that's the last bit before it goes out to the uh, to the back end. So we're going to make sure that we create a log with every call. Then we're going to create a scope policy, and then we're going to update that API that we just created and the first step with that specific policy and then we're going to activate the API. All that can essentially be done in one script. Um, it's easy enough for a postman to create, to, to get that into a, a Jenkins pipeline or any other pipeline, uh, Azure pipeline uh, or create a, a Terraform or create another uh, automation tool script, or just create it into a, a shell script if you wanted to, although I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily. Just, I'm going to create a little bit of delay here between the different steps, say okay, save responses, and then I can run the API gateway services one by one. So creating the API from the URL, Getting the ID, creating the log, scope, update the API, and we're going to activate the API. Now, if I now go back here and go back to my APIs, we've just created a new API with scope policy, and it has every single feature that I just talked about in that script. So we go back in got that API, pet store API with login vacation traffic. That's all the information I've put in there. I also said it would be version 1.0. It has created a scope. So in the API details, we've got two resources. We've got a resource pet and a resource test. A resource pet with two uh, individual um, uh, methods in it. So if I now go to the scope, the definition of, of that pet scope is essentially the resource forward slash pet to which uh, we're going to set some policies. So if we now go into the policies, we can see that on the API, the full API, there aren't many policies set. But if you go to pet scope, we can see that that log invocation is there. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to invoke log, store the whole payload uh, as well, um, uh, the request payload as well as the response payload and send that uh, to both the API gateway and send it as an email. So there are a number of destinations that you can choose uh, for, for sending those logs. Logs can be in local logs. It can be <clears throat> stored locally in the API gateway. We actually use Elasticsearch under the cover 
which will then enable you to do all sorts of research or we can or one of the other things that we can do is we can uh, uh, send these logs to an external elastic search which is which then you can use your own reporting on um, another destination is um, that central side product that I talked about, which is what we use for uh, centrally managing um, all the APIs. As I said, you could have multiple API gateways. If you then need to do reporting on, on the usage of the APIs and you have to go to six different places to do that, that's not very good. So having a centralized either um, making use of central sites or making use of an external elastic search is going to uh, help you a lot there. So that's that's essentially how simple these is. So once you once you know how to use the product, once you know, once you have got familiar with how to set policies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's very easy to create those kind of scripts that will automate. Okay. So the next, so you your your initial engagement with this product will probably be via the uh, the user interface. The more and more I, our our customers are using this product the less and less frequently they actually go to the user interface because they have automated everything that they have and they just use and reuse the scripts that they have. Um, the scripts are one way of making sure that there is consistency across your different APIs. So this means that um, you might impose things like um, identification and access management for a number of APIs and make sure that they all uh, that that is applied to every single API that you want it to. Um, there is, however, apart from the automation, one other cheeky way of doing this, um, and it's it's something that um, uh, that I surprise I seem to surprise a lot of people with who've already used API Gateway. So I just want to make sure I've shown this to you. So we've got apart from policies on an API on a single API basis, like we've just shown, you, we can create what we call global policies. On the one hand, we've got things like threat protection, um, things that, have, you know, we all know things like denial of services and, and some rules that you can set, the recognition of mobile apps and, uh, and mobile devices. But we also have something which we call um, global policies. A global policy, it has exactly the same, um, same policy configuration. So here I've got an example transaction logging whereby I say, look, we're going to log everything. Um, and that's the policy. And this is this, the, this is the very simple policy that, that you have. However, there is a way that we can restrict that a little bit and we can, um, so rather than having that apply to every single API in your API gateway, we can say, look, we want to do that on every single, and here you've got your filter. Um, we can do it on every API type. We can do it on every single um, REST method that there is, but only on the APIs that I have tagged with log transaction or log trans. So very simply by going to an API, and I'm just going to, Go back to my Star Wars API here and edit it. And now say, I'm going to add a tag. Just by adding that tag, I will actually enable uh, that policy that I've just set. Uh, we've got now we have now added a login for uh, invocation automatically and it comes from the global policy transaction logging so that's a little neat way neat way you can um, automate some of the policy setting without doing it via the scripted way i'm going to keep it here i'm just going to go back to um, stop sharing and see if there are any questions.